This is what is astounding to me about the battery market. So this is comparing the first quarter of battery projects. And I guess they do that because that data is available for 2017. So they can do kind of like a, a true apples to apples uh, comparison. But what we can see is this, this explosive growth rate in the U.S. battery market in terms of shovel-ready projects. And this, is, uh, this should not surprise anyone who's worked in the solar industry for the past 10 years. Uh, you know, when I got started, I built residential systems and uh, might have done about 20 residential systems before the local rebate program busted and uh, I had to go on the road and teach. Well, then that got me into commercial projects. And so my, my very first commercial solar project was twice as large as my past two years experience in the solar industry combined. And then we went on to triple the size of that array over an expansion process. And then we went to build a one megawatt project that was you know, almost twice as large as the, uh, as the original commercial rooftop market. So you know, solar is very scalable and it looks like the battery industry is also scaling up. And you know, the difference between doing a one kilowatt hour battery bank and maybe a, a 10 kilowatt hour battery bank is, is not as technically difficult as you know, you're, you're increasing the size of the battery bank tenfold. The growth in the solar industry today has leveled off. I mean, uh, the volume in solar is, is going to shrink this year. Because back in the day in 2008, 2009, 2010, the, uh, you know, the solar industry was growing by 100% a year. You know, at the time, it was projected that between uh, 2000 and 2020, the solar industry would have grown at about 30% a year. But, you know, what we're seeing is that's true. But a lot of that growth occurred because of the subsidies up front. And now the accelerated growth has kind of caused the market to uh, retract post-subsidy at a very high level. Well, so what that means is if you've been working in the solar industry lately, you might have felt a little bit less enthusiastic about the industry simply because you're used to this market of explosive growth. And now it's kind of stabilizing um, in, in most regions, at least for the time being. Whereas the battery market feels a lot like the solar market of uh, days past because it, they're still in that you know, boom, gangbuster growth phase. And actually, uh, what we'll learn is there's a lot more design expertise that goes into a battery bank um, and a lot of more site customization. I mean, we're, we're fast approaching uh, the point where if you're doing like a new construction solar project, just covering the entire rooftop in solar is not a terrible idea. And uh, to some extent, that really takes the design elegance out of the solar project. And some of your solar design softwares like Aurora Solar are making great strides in simply just putting in an address and outputting a set of solar plans. So uh, design knowledge in solar is you don't need to know as much as what you used to. But with batteries, nobody knows anything. You know, the whole solar market is it has gone away from batteries. And so if you can train up on batteries, that's like a nice, you know, strong skill set. We talk about in other classes, uh, the, co the commercial market in particular, which is the smallest market segment of, of residential, commercial and utility scale. It's the commercial solar market that has been uh, repressed by not having access to retail generation, but also uh, no ability to produce demand savings because of their demand rate structures. And so, uh, whereas at the residential level, you can do an array and get a uh, retail price generation rate, and at the utility scale, 
you can do an array and uh, maybe you only get half the retail price of electricity or even less, but the array is so large, you get economies of scale. Whereas a commercial solar array, it, it'll generate at about half a retail price and you, you know, you're limited by your rooftop space. So they haven't had the right rate structure uh, to, to participate in the solar industry. In fact, that's, that's led some utilities to think, well, if we're losing money because of solar, why don't we just move our solar customers onto rate structures that are more like the commercial market? And that solves our revenue loss problem. Um, and the commercial market, though, it is also interesting because compared to the residential market, uh, you do get some uh, economies of scale in that your your uh, your direct labor costs uh, go down, your uh, inverter costs go down. Uh, to some extent, the module prices, you know, it's pretty much the same either way. But things like your uh, design and engineering budget go down. Uh, so whereas a, a retail price solar array in the U.S. might go for around three dollars a watt, you know, the commercial market is is well under two. And so if you combine, you know, the economies of scale of commercial versus residential, you know, you have a nice project site, but again, they don't have the right rate structure, so the projects don't come out of the ground. You know, residential, you have net metering, and, and sometimes batteries are, are presented as batteries are what's going to help a customer overcome net metering so that they can store energy uh, w when the price of energy is low and they can sell electricity when the price of energy is high uh, and, and almost day trade electricity like the stock market. Or, you know, if a utility doesn't offer a true net metering plan, you could store the energy uh, and then use it as you, <laughs> as you need it. So, for example, in Mississippi, they, they define their net metering policy as, uh, you know, not net metering, as substantially less than net metering. It's more like avoided cost purchasing. And so you might think, well, since the utility is not giving me a very good rate for my electricity, um, I should store it in a battery bank. What we'll learn is that that is really not cost effective. I mean, you should do load shifting. You should see, you know, can I can I make more hot water when my solar array is on? And what what else can I do with this energy surplus so that I don't backfeed the meter? But the thing about batteries is they cost money to use. And so if you're cycling your battery to store electricity for energy arbitrage, you also have to take into account the cost of the battery itself and those costs are so high that you know energy arbitrage only makes sense in markets where you know the the difference between peak and off peak electricity is like 30 cents a kilowatt hour or more and so batteries really aren't a great solution for net metering in fact uh to be perfectly honest if all of net metering went away in the United States your solar owners would still um, sell their surplus electricity to the utility at avoided cost. You know, it wouldn't be popular, but that's what would happen. That's what, you know, uh, on-site generators do at the 80 megawatt level under PURPA. <clears throat> and so batteries are often presented as a residential uh, product to help the consumer overcome utility issues, but that's not what's happening on that's not why a residential customer would actually buy or use a battery you know what batteries enable a um, a residential customer to do is use their solar array during the blackout you know that's that's why you put a battery on a solar system is that that you can take your house off grid and there's a lot of misunderstandings about that you don't have to take your house uh, completely off-grid. You don't need to run a critical load panel. You can run your entire house. I mean, with, with solar, it's going to be different than having a generator. With solar, uh, you're going to have a lot of electricity in the middle of the day, 
and not a lot of electricity at night. So unlike having a generator where you have a stable amount of power and you just don't you don't even think about it, when you're in an off-grid mode with a very small battery, you still have to be energy conscious. But at least during the day, it's like normal. And at night, you know, maybe maybe it's going to be a little uncomfortable, but that's a lot better than not having any electricity at all. And so it's, well, how much more money does adding a battery system cost to take a home off grid, you know, to provide power during a blackout? You know, the difference between those two design criterions could be $70,000 or more. And so, um, you know, so how much do batteries cost to use? So, you know, keep in mind for, for most, you know, peak use versus off peak, you don't get much more than about a, a 15 to 17 cent differential between peak and off peak. Uh, so that the, the battery has to cost less than 17 cents a kilowatt hour. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels. You're not you're not saving any money. You're you're recouping this money. But then what's the cost of the battery to cycle? Well, if we look at lead acid batteries, versus the the latest model of the Tesla Powerwall 2. And I I hate talking about the Tesla Powerwall 2 because I really like focusing on shovel ready solutions and while there are customers who have the Tesla Powerwall 2, you know, they've sat on a wait list for years. You know, I can't just call up Tesla and order a, a Tesla Powerwall 2. Yeah. You know, you have to be on a wait list. There has to be a contractor program. You, you know, it's the, the barriers to that are, are hard, um, but it's also a well-known product. Um, there are some competing products on the market now um, that are a little bit more expensive than the Powerwall 2's retail price. But what good is that if you can't really buy it? Anyway, everyone wants to know about the Powerwall 2, so we're going to talk about it. There's another kind of lithium iron uh, ion battery. So there's a you know flooded lead acid is is pretty much the same and and the the big difference between a a small lead acid and a large lead acid is is you know the the volume of the battery is kind of directly proportional to how much energy it stores. With lithium ion batteries there's a little bit more variety. And so you have like a, a lithium ion battery like the Tesla, which everyone thinks is like a modern, great to use battery. But then there's also a different lithium ion battery called a lithium iron phosphate battery. So it has a, a couple more elements uh, tacked on at the end of it. And basically it's, it's the difference is like a, a entry level lithium ion and a top shelf lithium ion. And you might think to yourself, well, top shelf, if it's the battery market, a lot of these customers want top shelf, but the, the price difference between lithium ion and lithium iron phosphate is, is eye gouging. It's, it's astounding. You know, it's so, it's so expensive that, that to run a, uh, a home, this is for an off grid project. And so we were kind of, evaluating different sizes of lead acid batteries at, at different price points. And there is, there is a, a top shelf lead acid and a, a bottom shelf lead acid too. Generally, if you want a top shelf lead acid, you're looking in the industrial batteries that right now they're really used to drive forklifts and uh, electric other on-site stationary electric machinery. Um, but but solar is is also good for a very long term durable uh deep cycle lead acid then there's weaker lead acid that's going to conk out after earlier cycles but it's also cheaper and so you know anyway you take the 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 number of kilowatt hours you're going to use and you take the cost per kilowatt hour to get your upfront cost and then you look at your how much of the battery bank on a day to day basis are you actually going to use? So if I'm I'm using 30% of a 105 kilowatt hour battery, or I'm using 20% of a 122 kilowatt hour battery. And how did I come up with 105 versus 122? Well, you know, that's based off the, the 
product range of the specific battery you're looking at. Generally, you go all the way up to 48 volts for your battery inverter and then see where you end up. And so we're looking at two different battery, lead acid battery banks, uh, a top shelf and kind of a, a mid range, a larger bank versus a smaller bank, a larger bank that's used less versus a smaller bank that's used more. And it, it turns out that the, the battery bank with the, the highest capital cost also has the lowest levelized cost of storage. But to use this industrial lead acid battery bank, and this does not include the maintenance cost, and lead acid batteries have maintenance. You can get sealed lead acid batteries, but if you're getting sealed lead acid batteries, you might as well uh, get lithium ion, in, in my opinion, especially if you can hold out another year or so. Sometimes you're forced into flooded lead acid simply because it's the uh, the best compromise right now for an off-grid project. And, and what we can see is we do save some money by going into the top shelf range, but it's not a substantial amount of money. And one thing to think about is, well... You know, I've I've done and I've done and priced out some. What does it look like on the other end of things? I've priced out, you know, the the bottom shelf uh, lead acid battery. You know, one that if you call up the battery distributor and you say I want to use this for an off grid solar array, they're gonna say, you know, don't do that. That battery bank's only gonna last you three or four years. So don't use the, the bottom shelf lead acid because uh, <laughs> you're going to have to replace it very soon. But the thing is, if you go all the way to the bottom shelf, you know, you can find, you know, what are called like marina lead acid batteries, not car batteries, but, um, you know, golf cart batteries and stuff like that in the $90 a kilowatt hour range. And if you go and you do, okay, you say, okay, well, I'm going to be cycling these things down to, to you know, 60% every single day. And you're like, okay, well, it's going to conk out in two or three years. Well, that's the point. You know, if that, if that lead acid battery only lasts 900 cycles, um, you know, you can still find this bottom shelf lead acid kind of in the same price range, in that 17 to 19 cents a kilowatt hour range. And so the battery market is actually quite interesting, even if we're just looking at uh, lead acid, where you would have like a, a top shelf option that's going to last for a much longer time, you know, 4,100 cycles, 365 days a year. You know, you can see a, a industrial top shelf flooded lead acid battery that's designed around a 20% depth of discharge to last you know, maybe 12 or 13 years under the, the proper design. Or this premium flooded lead acid, 365 days a year, you know, this premium lead acid might only last you uh, eight or nine years. And then this 900 cycle bottom shelf would only last you maybe two and a half or, or three if you're lucky and then conk out on you. Well, the difference is you're also into your upfront capital cost requirements. And so what, what is really interesting to me is, you know, is it better to, to, to go with a battery bank that is large and expensive or looking at the battery market and where it's now and where it's only going to be in, you know, two or three years, given that it's in that exponential explosion curve, is it better to go all the way to the bottom shelf and 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 just buy the cheapest lead acid battery you can to start playing around with it. You know, you you might say, okay, well, lithium ion is more cost effective, but you know, let's do a a, a small battery now and and assume the battery is going to conk out in a few years uh, to to play around with, get our money back, and then in a few years from now. You know, we'll upgrade to a better technology. So that's kind of called having a, a starter battery. And so the concept of getting a, a cheap starter battery to fulfill basic battery needs now, but then later upgrade the battery technology, that's all possible. Uh, now, the Tesla 
Powerwall 2 is actually rated for a deeper cycle. Uh, the, the lead acid, if you start cycling it down into the, the 60, 70, 80% range on a regular basis, it damages the battery. And we're going to explore that a little bit further on in the program. But a lithium ion battery, you can actually cycle all the way down. Well, technically that's not true. You know, you know how on your cell phone, when it's completely out of battery, which happens to me all the time, and you, you press and hold the little button down on the side of your phone, you know, eventually the battery light comes on and it's like, charge me. I don't have any electricity. Um, and, you, and you're like, ah, I know, I know there's a little bit of electricity in there because it's, it's telling me to charge my phone. So it has to be something. You know, even with lithium ion, they're not designed to be completely discharged. They, they keep a little bit of reserve capacity uh, in the lithium ion, because if it does get discharged truly all the way down to zero, it'll brick. Um, so, you know, if you like uh, short circuit it, you know, drop your battery in the toilet or something. Um, what's interesting about the power wall is that they don't give you uh, a warranty cycle, they actually track every kilowatt hour that comes out of the battery bank through the inverter. And then they say, and that's the warranty. And that's pretty interesting because that gets you into buying their inverters, uh, which is part of their, their strategy. And based on their suggested uh, retail pricing, the, the Tesla Powerwall 2 is more like 15 cents a kilowatt hour. But, but even so, you know, even if you're using the Powerwall 2, going from, say, you know, costing 15 cents to save 17 or 18, that's not, that's just not going to get you a, a return on investment. Well, even cheaper still is the lithium iron phosphate. That's the top shelf lithium ion battery. Uh, you know, Sonin battery makes them. Uh, Sony makes them. You know, it's, it's tip top shelf but they're also the most expensive. And like, this is only for 42 kilowatt hours. So, you know, with the premium FLA, you know, you, you actually have more capacity for substantial, for $16,000 than you would get spending 95,000 on the lithium iron phosphate. It's just that, um, so, you know, even going into this top shelf range, uh, you would have to spend $300,000 to get the same capacity as what a $25,000 FLA battery bank would be. It would just last you, you know, longer. And so um, over time, these, uh, you know, the lithium ion phosphate is a cheaper technology. In fact, the, the cheapest battery technology that I know of is a, a nickel iron battery. So it's not lead acid, it's not lithium ion. You got to maintain it like flooded lead acid, but it's actually, you know, nickel iron. And, uh, you know, that gets down to around eight or nine cents a kilowatt hour. But again, the problem with nickel iron as compared to lead acid is, you know, it may be substantially cheaper than lead acid, but you have to buy three times as many cycles when you commit to nickel iron. And so this is a 30 year battery versus a 11 or 12 year battery. You know, you might not want a 30 year battery right now. You know, in 10 years, a 10 year old battery is gonna look a lot more dated than that solar array. Um, so anyway, there's, there's, you really have to know the specific reasons why you're buying a battery on to which one you're you're selecting and just the the short of it is like if you're going off grid completely you're probably going into flooded lead acid you know if you're if you are building a project in a year or two from now you know give the the lithium ion market a little bit of time to get more material uh out the door uh, at that point, if you have a solar array, you might want to add, a, you know, not a lithium ion battery bank that's 67 kilowatt hours, maybe a lithium ion bank that's only six kilowatt hours, you know, something that's small, but would only cost you, 
you know, a few thousand dollars to enable your home to have backup power during an emergency without having to think about it. You know, a battery that you don't need to maintain, a battery that's kind of out of sight, out of mind. You know, you don't have to fuss with a generator, et cetera. But there still will be limitations to that. You know, you have a little bit of electricity at night, a lot of electricity during the day. Now, even on an overcast day, you're still getting power out of your array. So, you know, you're going to have power during a hurricane, um, and you'll have a lot more power than your neighbors do, for that matter. Uh, lithium iron phosphate, it's used for, like, the most remote applications. So, like, the National Park Service or a radio tower or a battery that's going to be buried underground and a weather monitoring station, you know, a battery that, that you're, you don't want to touch, you know, until you're replacing the entire machine. You know, that's what lithium iron phosphate is for, is, is uh, uh, you know, you, you pay for it because of the, the cost of traveling out to wherever the battery is for maintenance is, is prohibitive. But, you know, we're, you're not really powering high power applications with lithium iron phosphate um, at this time. And so, uh, you know, and, and then nickel iron, you know, it, the problem with nickel iron is it, it has the maintenance of FLA. So by the time you're getting into buying a more premium battery bank, uh, you know, owners are, are sizing up the, the lithium ion market. So anyway, what my personal philosophy is, is, is uh, if you're trying to go off grid, stay in the FLA battery range and see where the market looks like in the future. If you're not going off grid, you don't need as much power and you're not crazy to consider lithium ion. Uh, but if you're a client who wants top shelf, you, you still might want to go back and just just look at the, the Tesla Powerwall or its competitors, which we'll get into in a little bit. So uh, anyway, what we really need for residential storage to be cost effective is the battery to save us twice as much money as what it's costing us. You know, in other words, like a, a solar array has a 25-year payback or a 25-year warranty, and most customers will want it to have a payback of at least 12 and a half years or sooner. You know, so they, you know, the cost of electricity is 12 cents a kilowatt hour. That solar array needs to have a levelized cost of six cents a kilowatt hour so that it gets that 12 and a half year payback over a 25 year term. You know, similarly, a battery needs to save you almost twice as much as what it costs you to use in order for uh, the payback to be there for people to open up their wallets and say, you know, I will buy that. Uh, to save money off my electric bill. And so, uh, you know, where you want to look for battery opportunities um, is where the price of electricity, you know, we know that batteries are costing in the, the you know, 12 to 17 cent a kilowatt hour range. So what we have to ask ourselves is where is the price of electricity over you know 24 cents a kilowatt hour or where is the the time of use rate over 24 cents a kilowatt hour every day of the year uh to see where the battery market is and that could be hawaii you know in a hawaii the the retail price of electricity it might be 40 cents a kilowatt hour or more and you're not allowed to export electricity onto the grid and so, you know, if it's 40 cents, that's just going to be, you're going to buy it from the grid at night or you're going to store it in a battery. You know, you're going to store it in battery for 15 cents instead of buying it from the grid at 40 cents. But, you know, so you need that extreme valuation between, you know, exporting the electricity or burning it uh, and, and buying electricity for batteries to make sense. And so here's some markets. Um, you know, Alaska, you know, Alaska has high electricity prices, but they're still not like California or Hawaii. But then you get into some remote fishing villages where they're being powered off of diesel generators and, uh, you know, electricity gets pretty expensive. Um, 
even if you are not in an area where the price of electricity is expensive, you may look at some of the uh, the electric co-ops in your region. Because if you get into a, a rural area, the price of electricity tends to go up as there's fewer ratepayers uh, buying into the system. And so, uh, you know, there are little spots where, uh, you know, here's the, in, in Michigan, but this is up in that that other part of Michigan and, and copper country. Uh, so that's they're kind of a, a peninsula. Now, um, many states have had uh, electric policy on uh, on utility scale storage and are implementing utility scale projects. These are more like pilot projects where you know the utility is doing a, a battery bank just to to see what it could do. Uh, none of it's at scale so that they could actually level out you know the the electric grid for the time being. But then again, um, you know. Yeah, got to dip your toe in the water at some point. And uh, there's there's a few ways to install a battery bank. Uh, the, the easiest way is just what's called AC coupling. And so AC coupling is when you have your, you know, electric service panel and uh, you've tied your solar inverter in at the bottom of the bus bar and then... Uh, you know, your battery inverter gets installed right next to it, again, at the, the bottom end of the bus, bus bar. And that's until you get up to 20% ampacity per the 120% rule we talk about in the solar programs. Or you just do what I like to do is a supply side connection, which is before we get to the home main service panel. Remember, on a, a supply side connection, you got your, your main breaker panel. And then you have your utility meter and uh, uh, supply side is when you go into here instead of the load side. And so if we go into the supply side, we can do all the way up to 100% of our service amperage, which is about 48 kilowatts for a residential service. And that's not, you know, that's only, only in Mississippi where you get into antebellum type homes where you can see through the floor but they're owned by the, the big businessman who has, uh, you know, water fountains and duck ponds and a walk-in beer cooler and stuff like that. You, know, you really have to, to shoot the moon in order to, to have a home that needs 48 kilowatts of uh, solar power. So uh, anyway... For an AC coupled array, it's as simple as you have your solar array plugged into your panel, and then you go and plug in a battery inverter right next to it. Now, the question is, well, can you actually do that? If you have a microinverter array, can you get a battery inverter right next to it? If you have a Fronius inverter, can you put a SMA battery inverter right next to it? And the answer is, yeah, you can. You know, what's what's interesting is the, the battery-less inverters are rated to shut down when there's a grid failure. And the battery inverter is smarter than the batteryless inverter. It's like all this kind of like a, a master slave uh, relationship where the battery inverter is driving the batteryless inverter. And you could say, well, if they're if they're the same brand, they'll actually communicate with each other. So like in the, the SMA product line, it can actually detect the loads of the home and then dial up and dial back the uh, solar array based off the loads of the home. And that's really only suitable for off-grid because, you know, what that would mean is instead of turning the solar array off and running off the batteries because the batteries are full, you know, instead you could just keep the solar array on but kind of curtail the power to meet the load. And so in off-grid, it's good to have everything kind of smart and working together intelligently. But if you're grid connected and your batteries are full, you know, any surplus power from the array is just going to go into the grid. And so you don't need to worry about like overcharging your batteries or anything like that on an AC coupled system. Now, when there's a power failure and the grid goes down, what you put in is a, a transfer switch just like you would a, a whole house generator. 
And then it'll be like your home is off grid and you'll be running off your batteries. And then the sun will come up and you run off your solar array and the solar array recharges the batteries. And you can incorporate a generator as well to, uh, you know, give you additional energy security and also perhaps provide uh, cheaper off-grid power than a, a battery bank. Now you can you can do a lead-acid battery bank and then protect it with a generator uh, from deep discharging. Now, actually, it's almost like you know they call it a battery assist when you have a generator assisting the battery bank. But in a way, it's it's more of a generator assist because. Now you're allowing that generator to operate completely efficiently. You know, the any surplus power that doesn't go into your home will now charge the batteries back up. And then when the batteries are full, the generator clicks off. So you can actually, you know, improve your gas efficiency of an off-grid home running off a generator by considering solar and batteries. But when the home is off-grid and the batteries get full, the problem is the solar array may still be productive and you don't want to back charge the battery inverter. You don't want to overcharge the batteries. And so, and what we'll learn is it's kind of difficult to overcharge a battery at the lead acid level, but that's a, another discussion. You know, solar is a lot of power. You don't want to, you want to have a plan for where it's going to go. And if these, inverter systems do not communicate with each other what happens is the same grid shutdown protection is used to trick the solar inverter to go offline so the the battery inverter will send out a 61 hertz signal through the line and that'll trigger the the ul 1741 anti-islanding shutoff of the solar inverter and so if these are two incompatible brands, even so, the battery inverter can use the, uh, the safety provisions of the battery list inverter in order to control it. It's more elegant if they can do that through digital communication, but it does not have to be digital. And so in, in other words, if you have a solar array and you want to add a battery bank to it, while it's nice to stay within the same brand, all you really need to do is add a battery inverter and a, a transfer switch and, and you're good to go. Now, the cost of the battery inverter plus the cost of the battery transfer switch plus the cost of a battery bank that your client is going to be happy with, you know, that can easily be $10,000 or more. So I'm not saying that this is, you know, I'm not trying to say start adding batteries to your solar arrays now it's a good thing to offer, but just know that there is a game plan for retrofitting the solar arrays down the road. Now, if you know that you want to do batteries today, it is slightly cheaper to not have two inverters, to not have a battery inverter and, not, and a solar inverter. You know, the problem with the solar inverter is it's one way. You know, the solar power comes out of the array and goes into the load or goes into the grid, but it's all one directional flow. A battery inverter actually flows two ways, backwards to the grid and forwards, to, to, or backwards, I guess, to, to charge the battery bank. And what that means is a battery inverter is going to be more expensive than a, a regular solar inverter. In fact, much more expensive, about twice as much, because it's doing sig substantially more than the batteryless inverter. So it is slightly cheaper if you know you want batteries to dispense with AC coupling and just have one inverter for the entire system. And for just providing, uh, it, it may or may not be the best solution for a grid connected home. Um, so anyway, what I'm talking about is, is uh, when you, the, the battery inverters are less efficient than the battery list inverters. 
And so when you're you're either using your power to go into your load or any surplus is being sold off to the grid, there's really no reason to use a battery inverter at the lower efficiency. And we're talking about a, a four or five percent efficiency difference. So it's not the end of the world, but but if you're if you're grid connected, you know, you want that solar array to operate as efficiently as possible, you know, put it on its own inverter. Where DC coupling makes the most amount of sense is if you're completely off grid. Because if you're completely off grid, you're always running off the battery. I mean, you're running off solar for a couple of hours in the middle of the day. And that solar array is so large, though, that most of its energy is going to go into charging the battery bank back up. And so in an off-grid home, it's, it's more efficient just to go directly into the battery rather than go from the solar array into the service panel and then from the service panel into the battery inverter and then from the battery inverter into the batteries and then from the batteries back into the load when you need it. And so there's there's all this debate about AC coupling versus DC coupling, and I don't really think it, it should be a debate. You know, AC coupling is is going to be the standard common practice at the residential level for, for grid-connected systems. Um, and then if you're off-grid, uh, you may consider DC coupling, but if you want to do like an off-grid community, you're probably going to AC couple anyway, uh, just to, you know, uh, because you're going to have all these distributed power systems. You're not going to have one central system. And so, uh, you know, I'm using DC coupling for an off-grid home, uh, but I only expect to do DC coupling for off-grid homes. I don't really expect to do it for uh, grid connected. Um. So just this is just kind of an overview of some parts that can be in a, a battery inverter system. Um, so they, uh, you may have a, a generator control, and you have to check to make sure that your generator is compatible with the generator control. Um, and this may be a function that you need or you don't need. For example, if you go with the, the top shelf battery inverter, like a Schneider inverter with a generator control and the top of the line, um, you know, the top of the line Generac for renewable on site power generation, then you're going to have an integrated system that can turn on and off and, and the, the generator can complement the solar power and the, the generator can charge the batteries and it's all nice and integrated and expensive. If you are trying to live uh, off grid and you don't have the budget for an expensive system, there's also a dirt cheap option. You know, you don't need a, a top of the line inverter that's rated for grid interconnection if you are not interconnecting to the grid and you're not using electronics that need a, a high degree of power quality. And at that point, your generator control may not be an on off switch, uh, but depending on what generator you use, if it's a generally if it's a portable generator, you know, like one on wheels that you can wheel in and out of your garage uh, for an emergency power supply, a portable generator, you can usually only turn on. You can't turn it on and off and on and off. Well, is that a problem or not? I mean, if I'm if I'm in a, uh, a winter storm situation where, uh, you know, I need to turn my generator on, you know, being able to turn it off probably isn't going to do me any good anyway, because I'm going to need, you know, I'll probably run the generator all the way through. And then when it runs out of gas, that might be the off switch. And so the cheap way to do off-grid solar would be to get a, a cheap battery inverter and a very small gas generator that automatically turns on and charges the batteries back up and then runs out of gas. Uh, and then you just you control how much you're running the generator by how much gas you're putting in the tank. Um, or you can get something that is much more automated and professional, uh, which is, you know, the difference between kind of doing a do-it-yourself 
tiny house uh, because you are living in your parents' backyard versus selling a client uh, a home that is going to offer the the feel of a grid connected home, uh, but have that off grid purpose in mind. So in other words, with AC coupling, you go from the modules into the service panel, into the load or into the grid. And so you have what it's called a one step process to go from the modules through the inverter to the point of use. Whereas if we're running off of our batteries under AC coupling, it's a three-step process. We go from the modules through the inverter, through the battery inverter, and then back down. And so in, in DC coupling to uh, get to the grid, to get to the point, it's always this two-step process. We're going through the voltage regulator called a charge controller. You know, that keeps the voltage nice and even going into the batteries. So you have a one-step process through the charge controller and then a one-step process through the inverter. So that's a total of a two-step process. So that's why DC coupling doesn't work for grid connection. And grid connection, most of the power is going to be sold off to the grid. And so you want that efficient one-step process instead of a two-step. But then again, for off-grid, it is slightly more efficient to put everything together in this kind of configuration. But we're talking about slightly. I mean, if you're a solar installer and the AC coupling technique looks uh, just fine for your current business line, you don't need to figure out the DC side of things. You can just stay in AC coupling. I mean, we're talking about uh, maybe a thousand dollar difference on a, on a large residential project between AC coupling and DC coupling. And we're this residential project might be a forty or fifty thousand dollar project, so it's not a, a huge difference between um, AC coupling and the the cost savings of DC coupling. So why would why would a residential customer get a battery? You know, it might be because they're they're tired of paying the grid connect fee to the utility. And uh, you know the the grid connection fee is really the last uh, trump card that a utility has to play because solar is driving down the cost of energy, you know, power over time. So solar is tanking the price of energy during the day, and then batteries come in, and uh, you know the the reaction against solar is to raise demand charges. But then batteries come in and obliterate demand charges. And so what it boils down to is in the future, the utility may just have to give you a bill that says your electric bill is $100 a month and you're going to stay within this usage. Otherwise, your bill is going to be $160 a month and you stay within this usage, kind of like a, a cell phone plan. And so you might say, well, if my utility is already doing that by charging a high monthly interconnection fee, will I go off grid to save these interconnection fees? Where this might be an issue is if the utility has a solar discriminatory charge. So you're, you're, if you're paying what everybody else is paying, you're probably getting a good deal on your meter fee as a solar customer. And in fact, most solar customers are happy to pay uh, what we would consider to be reasonable grid interconnection fees, which are kind of in the $30 a month on down rate. And so my meter fee is only 15 bucks. If I go out into the rural countryside, it's 30 bucks, but even at 30 bucks a month, that's a, a reasonable price for monthly grid connection. Um, and, and for that matter, solar owners are not freeloaders. You know, they're using less electricity. They're generating renewable electricity, but they're still paying into those meter fees uh, just like everyone else's. So, you know, when, when people say they're not freeloaders, uh, yeah, maybe the utility needs to adjust their rate structures instead of insulting their customers. 
because they do have the option of just increasing the meter fees and and maybe getting rid of every other kind of rate structure out there. I mean, does the consumer have a right to an itemized electric bill? You know, maybe they do, maybe they don't. That's, you know, that's going to be something that public utility commissions are going to think about in the future. Now, one result of punitive utility policies that penalize solar owners you know, sometimes solar owners freak out and they're like, oh, the utility's making it so I can't do solar because they're putting in all these fees. Well, one solution is to take the solar array completely off grid. You might think, well, JR, going off grid is super, super expensive. Well, actually, you don't have to go off grid all of the time. You know, you could put a, a transfer switch between your service, but instead of putting it between your, your, your grid connection and your backup generator. Instead, you put it between your, gener your grid connection and your solar array. So in other words, the solar array is always disconnected from the grid. It's never connected to the grid. And then you have a battery bank in between to maintain your power as you're switching. And so if you're going to do a battery bank, you could actually, uh, you know, run off the solar array during the day and then disconnect the solar array at night and run off the grid at night. So that's kind of neat. Now, what you lose is the ability to sell back surplus power from the grid. And so you have to look at, well, it, you know, we're, we're assuming that the grid policy is punitive so that selling that backup power doesn't make any sense. You know, what's, what's more likely is that solar owners are just going to have to get used to the fact that they're not going to get uh, the, the incentives that they used to from the utility and that, you know, they're, you know, they, that's just something that has to be taken into effect with design. Now, so the grid assist configuration is used to kind of tell the utility that you're not interconnecting. So you might get an electrical permit, but you might not get an interconnection agreement. And that might flag it so that the utility doesn't move you onto that punitive rate structure because there's no interconnection agreement. However, in 2017 National Electric Code, they have actually defined, uh, you know, these kinds of systems as being grid connected. You know, so, you know, the, the definition of a microgrid is one that operates in parallel with or in connection to a uh, electric grid. And so, you know, it basically the way like Mississippi Power defines it is if your solar system touches the electrical lines that are at any point supplied by their electrical system, you're still considered interconnected to their grid. So uh, I don't know what that means in terms of, of, of where this is going to go, but that's a couple of different, you know, uh, scenarios where what the solar array owner could do facing obstruction. But then again, that's not the, the last, that's not the final word.